Well, thank you guys for being here with us tonight. I love Tuesday nights, the last Tuesday of every month. And if it's your first time, we're really glad you're here. My name is Sydney. I get to serve as the college and young adult pastor here at the Vista. And it's a privilege to get to just take a night out of our week and spend time fellowshipping and worshiping together. So I hope that this time can be restful and encouraging to you. Um, And also, if it's your first time here, just so you know how things are going to work over the next hour is that we, I'll talk a little bit about the text that we're breaking down and then give you guys time to discuss at your tables, uh, because I think it's so much more powerful when you guys can talk amongst each other and learn from each other, and it'll help it stick better throughout the rest of our week as we learn from each other. And so that's what we're doing tonight. Um, We have been journeying through the first few chapters of Genesis together this semester. Uh, I think Genesis is such an interesting book packed with a lot of important information about who we are and who God calls us to be, and it's so important that we understand the beginning, we understand the origin story to truly understand what's next for us as children of God. And so that's kind of what we've been doing this semester. We've talked about being made in the image of God. We've talked about receiving this origin story. And then last month, Joel talked about how work was pre-fall, and so work is a gift, and how do we see our work as a gift? And he also talked about relationships uh, being a gift and a part of God's design for carrying out the mission um, of being made in the image of God. And so that's what we talked about last month, and this month we are going to be talking about where things went wrong in the garden. And So we're gonna start in Genesis chapter two, verse eight. You can go ahead and turn there, right at the beginning of your Bible. It'll be up on the screen for you to follow along as well. So Genesis two, starting in verse eight, it says, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then we'll skip down to verse 15. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And so what we get here, we see the the calling of humans, the vocation of humans that God gives them to cultivate and rule and work the garden. That's what Joel talked about last month. And we see that God created humans to be free and to enjoy the garden and to have authority over it. But then we also see a prohibition here. And it says, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So this tree of knowledge of good and evil was placed at the center of the garden, right next to the tree of life. And I want you to think about what is your immediate thought when you hear that this one tree that Adam and Eve are not supposed to touch is at the center of the garden? What comes to mind? Temptation. Temptation. Yeah, like why would God do this? Why did God put the tree, the one tree that is prohibited to touch or eat at the center of the garden? I think immediately for me, I'm like, why would God tempt us like that? Was God setting Adam and Eve up for failure? Uh, Walter Brueggemann says this, he says, little attention is given to the mandate of vocation or the gift of permission. The divine will of vocation and freedom has been lost. The God of the garden is chiefly remembered as the one who prohibits. And I think if we're honest with ourselves and if I think if we look at uh, society, what people think about our God that we worship, they often think about and remember the story as a God who doesn't give a free gift to enjoy the garden, but a God who prohibits. We get so focused on 
the one thing that we're not supposed to touch. We get caught up on the limit that God has set on the one tree and forget the entire garden that has been gifted to us. And not only do we have freedom in it, but we have authority to rule over it. So I'm going to challenge us to think about how, how, how do we think about boundaries specifically? Do we think about boundaries as a gift or do we think about them as some mean rule that someone's trying to keep something good from us? And I think we really should reframe our way of thinking about boundaries, about this prohibition we get here in the beginning and the things scripture teaches us that we should refrain from throughout the Old and New Testament as gifts instead of mean rules that are to keep us from enjoying life. Here's why, I want us to notice that the tree of life and the tree of death are at the center of the garden and Adam is not at the center. So Adam is around the tree of life because the tree of life at the center represents God feeding life out into the garden. Revelation 2, 7, so we hear about the tree of life in the very beginning and then the tree of life at the very end of scripture. It says, whoever has ears, let him, them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in paradise with God. And so what the tree of life represents is complete unity with God, no separation, being in paradise with God, the giver of life. And so this is where Adam's life comes from. So up until this point, God is making the tree of life the center, and it's God and not Adam. And then the boundary that God has placed on the tree of knowledge of good and evil is to keep Adam from becoming like God. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is to remind us that we are not God, that we don't have to be God, and that's a gift. And even though Adam does not understand the difference of good and evil at this point, uh, he does know that there is a limit placed on him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer explains it this way. He says, the prohibition means nothing other than this. It means, Adam, you are who you are because of me, your creator. So now be who you are. You are a free creature, so now be that. You are free, so be free. You are a creature, so be a creature. The boundary is to allow Adam to be a flourishing and free human because after all, that's what God created him to be. The the tree is a gift to protect him from something that humans were never designed to have to deal with, to be God-like. We're made in the image of God, but that's different from trying to be like God, to put ourselves in the same place as God, to try and take on that authority. And so the boundary is to protect Adam and Eve. It's to help them experience the good life that God has created them to live. And so for our first question, I want us to talk about why do we as humans get so caught up on what is prohibited? And is there a boundary that you are struggling to see as good? And where have you been able to recognize boundaries as a gift? So y'all go ahead and talk about it. Okay, does anyone want to share what their table talked about or something from your table that you would think would be helpful for everybody to hear? Good, boundaries, I'm proud of you. (laughs) Y'all going to put a boundary on me right now and say we're not talking on a mic. (laughs) Oh, okay, thanks, Justin. I want to hear what people have to say. What What did we talk about? Ooh, put me on the spot. What did we talk about? We talked a lot about how, oh, boundaries. What's like the first thing that y'all's minds go to when you hear the word boundaries? You're asking me? Okay. Uh, first, 
first one that my mind goes to is relational boundaries. That was his girlfriend, by the way, that just said that. So. I know. Jeez. <laughs> relational boundaries, not just with, you know, your significant other, uh, but with other, like maybe you have some boundaries with your parents, maybe you have some emotional boundaries. Those things are things. I'm just walking around, chilling. Um, <laughs> I'm coming over here because I saw this table <laughs> wanted to talk about it. But we think that um, sometimes boundaries suck because, like, we want to, like, we want to sin, right? Like, that's the, ultimately, for lack of a better way to say it, that's, that's what it is. And I think it's hard to see those boundaries as good because we're so short-sighted and we don't have the ability to look into the future and actually gauge how this thing currently can affect us in the future. Mm. Does anyone feel that? Yes. Okay. Perfect. That was great, Justin. I'm going to hand this one over now. (laughs) So my friend David right here, he said, I just surrender my life to Jesus. I focus on Jesus. And that's my boundary, just period. I was like, that's a word. You just focus on Jesus and there's nothing else after that because he'll lead you in the right direction. You don't have to focus on what you do and don't do. It's Jesus, period. Yeah. And that's on period. Anyone else? Anyone? I'm about to, okay. How'd I know? How did I know? Naomi, do you want it or does Hannah? Go ahead, Naomi. Okay, so on the first question, we talked about a reason why we caught up on what is prohibited. We don't like acknowledging we don't have control over things. That's what Gracie said. And I mentioned that we don't like acknowledging our own mortality um, and our limitations. We want to believe we're capable of anything. Mm. And then on the last question, we talked about work boundaries and how it's hard for us to implement that in our lives. But we know that it helps in the long run because it helps keep us focused on what God has for us and, like, I guess, filling our cup. Is that kind of where we were going with that? I don't remember anything else in the other question. Are you, oh, people-pleasing? Oh, yeah, I'm talking about future FOMO and, like, worrying about meeting, <laughs> missing out on future things because we said no now because we're afraid people won't ask us in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then for the second question, I said, personally, that I'm finding the Lord is expanding the boundaries that I have been comfortable with in, like, going out with friends and stuff like that and trying to be really responsible. And I'm grateful that he's honored the decision to not be reckless when I was younger, but I'm like the barn. I don't want to go into the field and he keeps pushing me into the pasture, Mm -hmm. you know? So uh, we talked about that too. Yeah, that's awesome. Great. That was really good. Anyone else? I think it's super interesting how when we're young, like boundaries sound all negative. Like I can't have this, but I want it. But when we get older, we start to realize in our maturity, okay, some boundaries, like I really need these, these work-life boundaries, I need to put these things into place. And I, I think that can be true of our faith as well as we mature, we realize the boundaries scripture gives us um, are, are helpful and we need them. Y'all wanna, Ellie's table back there? Grace? Hello. Um, Okay, so we talked about how boundaries, like where you get caught up is because it temporarily seems satisfying to sin. So then, you know, boundaries can bring up shame. Um, And so to eliminate that shame, we talked about confession Mm -hmm. and how confession is so important and that confession confirms our faith that Jesus died on the cross and that's good enough and like that that it is finished. He died for all of our sins, um, past and present, um, for every single soul that will ever be. And so whenever we confess to one another, we are confirming our faith out loud to each other and then we are allowing to have the power of the Holy Spirit in us to say in those moments of temptation, it is finished. I don't have to walk in that way anymore of what I used to do. I don't have to walk in this shame. I can walk uh, with Jesus through this um, and live a life that's like glorifying to him. And that's like the whole sanctification Mm -hmm. process that our life's gonna be about. And we need our community, so this is awesome. 
preach. You get up here and finish the sermon. That, that was good. Right? If we believe in, like, the transformative power of Jesus, then, like, we as individuals have to do some soul searching on the confession piece, right? Because sometimes we, like, have a hard time giving way to that. Yeah. Like, actually having to repent and to turn the other way kind of requires action, and that's tough. Yeah. But we get to practice that in here tonight. <laughs> Glad you're at the table. That's fun. Go um, ahead, Sid. Yes. So like Grace was saying, sin is enticing, right? Sin is, um, it gets our attention. And I think it's so natural when we're told that we're not supposed to look at something, what do we want to do? You want to look at it. You're not supposed to touch something. What do you want to do? You want to touch it. Um, I, a silly story um, from when I was a kid, way too old to be doing this, um, but I knew you were not supposed to put things in an outlet. And I, so what do you want to do? You want to put things in an outlet and see what will happen. And so I stuck a pair of metal tweezers in an outlet. And thankfully, I'm still here, and I was not electrocuted, uh, but all the lights in the house went off, and that was a fun experiment. Uh, so we're, there's something in us that want to do the things that we're not supposed to do, right? And so let's keep reading uh, in Genesis 3, 1 through 7, and see what happens next. So it says, chapter three, verse one, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they saw that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And so did you catch that there? That the tree was delightful to look at. Sin is intriguing. Sin is designed to get our attention. Uh, Proverbs 14, 12, if we can get that up on the screen, it says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And so there's a lot of ways that we can think that feel right in the moment. But ultimately, if it is apart from what God says is good, it will lead to death. And so what happens here is the serpent starts out with a question. He says, did God really say? Did God really say not to eat from the tree of good and evil? And you know how we say there's no such thing as a bad question? Well, this is a bad question. And I want you to know that questions about our faith and about scripture and about God are so important and so welcome. We should have questions about our faith and God and scripture. If you've been at Vista for any amount of time, you've heard Austin or Dave talk about how your doubts, your questions are welcome here. We even have a whole ministry called Alpha that talks about the hard questions and you're allowed to come with whatever questions you have. Austin tells me I'm going to seminary to learn to ask better questions. So questions are good. Questions are not the thing that is evil in this situation. The what is evil is the nature of the question being asked. The nature of the question being asked is, can I be God's child on my own terms? Can I be God's child on my own terms? The good questions to ask are the questions that point us to Jesus, that help us learn more about who God is, who he says we are. There are questions like, is God a just God? That's a hard question, right? But it's one we should ask, and it brings us to learn more about the character of God, or does God really care about me? 
You might be asking that question right now, but ultimately, if you do your research and you talk to your community, you're gonna learn more about God and that question, how do, how do I see God moving in my life? That's a good question. But the bad questions are the ones that make you in charge and that you ask on your own terms. Like, did God really say premarital sex is bad? Or did God really say to be generous and give money to the poor? These are questions that we are ultimately using to manipulate our way into being in control. I think Grace talked about control too. And so this is where the serpent is getting so crafty. He's asking a question, a religious question for that matter, but it isn't to help Eve learn more about who God is. It's to help her take control and take the place of God. He's like, come on, Eve, you won't die. God's just trying to scare you. God's just trying to keep something special from you. And maybe you've had that narrative play in your head when you've realized you're coming up to a limit or to a boundary that you're like, should I cross this? There's just something special that's being kept from me on the other end, maybe, right? And that's how temptation begins. It's a spiral, right? But I want us to notice that Eve doesn't turn to her partner in ministry that um, Joel talked about last month. Eve didn't turn to God in this situation. I wonder what would have happened if she would have just brought God into this conversation or if she would have turned to her partner, Adam, and looked to him for accountability and said, hey, what, what do you think about this? decision. This thing looks really good, but should I make the move to take it? And no, she, she takes things into her own hands and she grasps for control. And so up until this point in the story, we see that God is the one who defines what is good and what is not good. And now in this moment in the story, we see humans getting the opportunity to be free, to practice their freedom and we see that they're gonna to get to decide if they're gonna trust what God says is good and what God defines as good, or are they gonna try and define good and evil for themselves? The Bible Project says this, I love, love the Bible Project. It says, to rebel against God is to embrace death because you are turning away from the giver of life. And so that is what Adam and Eve are doing here when they take the fruit. They are embracing death by turning away from the tree of life and putting themselves in the center instead. They have chosen autonomy. They've made themselves in charge and sin has entered the world. When you think about it, what is happening here, this sin, ultimately all sin is idolatry. All sin is trying to be God-like. Sin is to find good and evil on our own terms. And so we're constantly, now that sin has entered into the world, we're fighting this tension, right? Am I gonna trust what God says is good or am I gonna try and define good and evil on my own terms? And when we try and define good and evil on our own terms, it ultimately separates us from God and leads us to death. Uh, Austin talked about something similar a few weeks ago or maybe a few months ago at this point, but he talked about when we make a good thing an ultimate thing, it becomes a bad thing. When we twist something good and make it an ultimate thing, it becomes a bad thing. And I think um, Justin talked about how the f a very simple but really complicated thing that I think many of us are probably struggling with is... Um, boundaries in relationships, and specifically dating relationships. And I think sex and physical intimacy is a prime example of this. It's a good thing that God created and designed for marriage, but when we twist it to when we try and take control over it and take it into our own hands, instead of it leading to life, it leads to death, destruction, and pain. And so like this situation or many other things, when we take things and try and define good and evil on our own terms, it's only gonna separate us from God and lead us into shame. Uh, that could be a relationship for you. I, I think back to when I was in college prior to Aaron 
Um, I was in a relationship for far too long that I was trying to make good on my terms, but every sign of anxiety that was in that relationship and sin that was covering in that relationship and all my community that was telling me it was not what God had for me, um, if I would have just listened to that and allowed God to say what was good in my life um, and good for my future instead of trying to stay in control in that situation. Uh, Maybe it's as simple as getting up in the morning and you know that what is good is being in scripture and prayer and spending time with the Lord, but what really seems good and enticing in the moment is to scroll through your phone on, on social media and then before you realize it, it's time to go to work. And so simple things like that. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, he says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. And I think we have to think about this. We have the right to do anything. We are free. We are humans to live in freedom on this earth. But are we going to try and do it on our own? Are we going to try and choose autonomy and choose to think we can figure this out on our own, think that we can put ourselves in the place of God, or are we going to trust what God says is good for our lives? And we learn about what God says is good through scripture, and we learn about what God says is good through prayer and listening to the Holy Spirit. We learn what God says is good through our community, speaking truth into our lives. And so for our next um, question, I want us to talk about where are you tempting to be a child of God on your own terms? Where are you trying to define good and evil for yourself? Some of these questions are kind of same question, but where are you taking a good thing and twisting it um, and making it into idolatry? And how can you turn back to the giver of life and surrender trying to be like God? So how can you take a step back and realize, I don't want to be at the center and try and be like God. I want to be able to stand back and be free and enjoy life like God has created us to enjoy life, like Austin talked about on Sunday, but be able to receive it as a gift instead of trying to be in control. So y'all go ahead and talk about it. And yeah, break. All right. Got to wrap things up. Sorry if y'all are still talking. And part of me, I want to, like, I was thinking all the first-time guests in the room, I'm like, man, I feel bad. I'm sorry that we're having these hard conversations about sin and all this. But then I'm also like, no, we're not sorry because we want to have really real and sometimes hard conversations here. And so now at least you know what you're getting into. <laughs> um, I hope you're not scared away from us. But... So uh, I think it, it is hard to get distracted and by, by sin and wanting to take control. I think a lot of us identify that control is the root of this. And I know I love control, and it's a battle I have to fight every day. But if we are chasing after life, um, trying to be like God, we're going to be so Um, miserable and unsatisfied and we have to realize that Jesus is our only source of life. Uh, When Adam and Eve turned away from God by choosing to eat from the tree, they turned away from life and separated themselves from this perfect relationship from God and we fight that battle every day to turn away from God and choose to define good and evil for ourselves and sometimes it can feel hopeless, right? Like are we ever gonna get out of this cycle? But we know we're in a few weeks, we're about to celebrate that our story isn't hopeless and it doesn't end in death and separation, but it ends in life because of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and being the new source of life, the new definition of what is good. Uh, Jesus says in John 6, verse 35, that I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And so until Jesus' is return, and until we're in perfect paradise and perfect relationship with God again, we get to eat 
from um, the, the fact that Jesus is our hope and that the cross has given us hope and given us a chance at life.